are now going to change slightly gears. And um, as I go on, you will discover that um, as science changes our views on the world, it also changes our views on ourselves. And this is consequential, and it will have ethical consequences, and it will have consequences for our <coughs> ethical behavior. So, um, the problem I want to discuss with you is <coughs> that our intuition claims that there is a clear separation between the spiritual and the material world. The classical ontological dualism, we believe that there is something immaterial, where the consciousness, where the mental exists, and that there is a material world, part of which is our organism, of course. Neuroscience claims, and I think rightly so, that all mental functions, including consciousness, are the consequence and never the cause of neuronal functions. So it's always the primacy of the brain, of the material processes that um, are organized in brains. So the primacy of meta and um, natural scientists adhere to this um, position. They claim that mind arises from matter and not the other way around. And there is ample evidence from clinical studies and uh, neurobiological investigations for a very close and causal relation between neuronal processes and mental phenomena. You're all familiar with this. This leads us to the conclusion that perceptions, thoughts, decisions, emotions, beliefs and consciousness depend on the material processes in our brains. Here is the player. This is the organ that supports all our cognitive and executive functions, and uh, scientists consider this as the seat of the soul and of the self. Um, I have unfortunately no time whatsoever to talk about the marvels of this system, about the neurons, 10 to the ninth of these little fellows. Oops, um, yeah, I have to advance this. Um, of these little fellows that sit in the cerebral cortex and are half a millimeter wide here, and we have about 10 to 9, um, so it's a 10 with 9 zeros of these fellows in the brain. Each of them is connected to something like 10 to 20,000 others and receives as much input. I have no time to talk about those <laughs> complexities. But believe me, it is, it is a terra incognito. We understand very little. It's very hard to approach uh, the problems in this very complex structure. The primacy of the spiritual dimension, which is still defended by many of, many of us, um, is based on the idea that there is something like mental causation, that uh, immaterial mental processes can influence our behavior, our brains. Um, in the Buddhist philosophy, for example, um, it's commonly assumed that spiritual practices change uh, our behavior and thus change the brain. Um, we all think that conscious decisions instantiate somehow actions, make our brain do what our consciousness wants it, the brain to do. Uh, we are all convinced that moral convictions guide behavior, and, and we know that contents of belief systems erect cathedrals. So there is a reality that uh, is causal, um, causally interacting with the material world. Now, the problem is, how can immaterial entities act upon material substrate, in this case the brain? If that were possible, it would violate all the natural laws that we know of, because something immaterial cannot interact with something material. It would have to exchange energy, and if it can exchange energy, it cannot be immaterial. So there is an epistemic conundrum, and um, we natural scientists, we think that this cannot happen. So the task would now be to find an evolutionary explanation for the emergence of our spiritual dimension in which we participate, undoubtedly, in order to overcome the dichotomy between mind and matter. So the old classical philosophical problem. So somehow we have to try to overcome this ontological dualism without, however, sacrificing human dignity. Uh, because if we get rid of these mental dimensions, and if we have a naturalistic explanation for it, it's um, an attack on our narcissistic self model. In order to introduce this topic, I have to talk a little bit about the constructivistic nature of perception. Um, neurobiology has shown very convincingly that what we perceive is the result 
of interpretations based on a comparison of sensory evidence, what we get from the sense organs, with a priori knowledge, knowledge that is stored in our brain that we call priors. And this applies also, and keep this in mind for our self-perception, also the way in which we perceive ourselves depends on these priors that we have stored in the brain. So here are a few examples. Um, you see this little concave um, ditch in here, and um, then uh, we do something, and then all the others are concave. And um, if I do this, you see that what has been convex becomes concave, simply because your brain assumes that light comes from above, and if light comes from above, something that has the shadow above needs to be concave. So your brain calculates something, makes an inference, and then it presents you this as a percept on which you, doubt, you don't doubt. If we start to discuss about the convexity and concavity, you would, uh, we would all agree. Next example, which I like even more. Um, I claim that this surface is as dark or bright as this one. It doesn't look as if it were, but I can show you that it actually is if I take a, a little bit the context away. Um, I, I do nothing but adding these white bars, and you will see in a moment, uh, brightness is exactly the same. So how come? Um, the brain sees the shadow that is thrown by this green column. We have just seen that the amount of photon, the luminosity, reflected by A and B is exactly the same. But because the brain sees that shadow, it calculates and says, if there's a shadow, then this B must be brighter. And it computes the B brighter and presents you this result of a computation of an inference as your primary perception. Even if you know why this happens, it doesn't change your perception. A is still darker than B. Keep this in mind. This will be very important later. So, Another important ingredient that I need is that as um, evolution proceeds, brains become more and more complex. And what happens essentially is, and again, I can't get into details at all, that in, in simple brains, and the rat brain is still rather complicated, there's a fairly fast path from the sensory centers to the executive of the motor centers. So there's not much room for interpretation. But in our highly developed brains, we have a lot of additional areas, mainly in the cerebral cortex, that talk to each other and that digest the outcome of these early computations again in the same way. So the brain is a reflexive organ. It looks at itself, and this is the basis for our ability to um, create meta-representations, representations of representations of representations, so we can run protocols of processes that are going on in the brain. So, with all these uh, prerequisites, um, and again, I can't give you all the reasons, uh, we now know that because of this increasing differentiation of the brains, of these increasing re-entry loops that are generated by adding processing structures, um, we become able, by comparing different modalities, to abstract from things by nesting relations, making complex nested constructs, which we call syntax, we open the options to a, a symbolic communication system, to language. And because of this recursive processing, we are also able to uh, have something like metacognition. We know that we are aware of something. We know that we are conscious. And these are prerequisites for language and these pre prerequisites for a theory of mind. Theory of mind is simply the ability to imagine what goes on in the brain of the respective other, th other when they watch each other and they can entertain dialogues of this format, I know that you know how I feel and oh, I know that you know how I know. And this is necessary in order to individuate yourself and to get a concept of the respective other. So, within biological evolution, we can so explain quite well how the material interactions between neurons in neuronal networks lead to perceptions, actions, to behavior, 
and how we emerged as cognitive agents endowed with, with fairly interesting functions. But can we also account for the immaterial, for this mental and spiritual dimension in which we uh, undoubtedly participate? Um, without postulating ontological dualism, which for natural scientists is difficult. Now the proposal is that this compelling experience to possess an immaterial or a spiritual dimension, that this results from perceptions that are shaped by implicit priors that are provided by cultural evolution. You have just seen the mightiness of priors in shaping your perception, okay? Um, now I claim that cultural realities also serve as priors, and this will help us a little bit further. Because these perceptions, they become an integral constituent of our self-model. And how this works, I will try to show you. Um, how are social realities constructed? If there are interactions among agents endowed with the unique cognitive abilities of us, so theory of mind, etc., these interactions can lead to the emergence of a novel class of realities that John Searle has called the social realities, but there are also other names for it. Examples are empathy, fairness, greed, love, devotion, norms, vows, commitment, social status, all immaterial things, values, belief systems, moral imperatives, and of course also the attributions and concepts that we make on ourselves and to our respective other, the autonomous, intentional, free, and conscious self. These are constructions that result from the perception that is guided by social realities. So, how do we get social realities? <coughs> Imagine cave dwellers sitting in front of their cave eating together, symposium. This is so important to eat together. This is why we'll have dinner tonight as well and have lunch together. Um, they watch each other while they eat and share food. And they, there will be cases where they feel collectively, there is a greedy guy here and a very generous woman over here. So they start to perceive qualities that are immaterial. And if they succeed to share them, to direct shared attention onto these co collectively perceived qualities, they can mutually affirm each other of the reality of these entities and they can find the name for these immaterial entities and thereby get them into the real world. Um, they can represent these immaterial, intangible entities in rituals, and this is one of the most important functions of rituals, that they bring into the concrete world, into the material world, by dance or whatever, um, concepts that are spiritual, that are mental, that are not uh, material. And um, the arts, of course, the very early cave drawings, they are instrumental in bringing these concepts into the minds of the people to share these concepts and to name them and make them concrete, make them part of reality. So, if our perceptions are framed by social realities, um, they change, and in that sense, also our self-model changes in the same way. Then social realities assume the status of priors for the perception of others and oneself. And this is the constructive nature of perception that you have just seen. If you apply this to your self-perception, you have solved the problem. Now these uh, attributions, they are reinforced, of course, by education, by belief systems, by the observations of the others, and they are without contradiction for the simple reason that we do not know what is going on in our brain. We have no feeling for the processes in our brain. We see the results, but we don't see anything of the working. Like the priors that you used in order to interpret these illusions, um, you, don't know that you, you don't know that you have them. You just apply them. So the brain is transparent for us. We don't know what this thing does. We just see the result. So attributing a spiritual dimension to us is absolutely no contradiction. So play the game again. We have seen how behavior emerges from 
neuronal interactions. So material interactions cause something that is different. Behavior is not a biophysical process. You play the game again, you couple these cognitive agents, humans, form another network of interactions, social networks. They interact and exchange. Uh, they have a symbolic communication and you get yet another ontological level. You get beliefs, concepts and self-models. And these social realities again influence back the perception of these uh, agents that they have from each other. So, uh, in this way, um, well, I skip that one. <laughs> in this way, um, one can find a or at least propose a naturalistic explanation for the emergence of our spiritual dimensionality dimension. So we need uh, the evolution of agents with specific cognitive functions. Uh, this is, we have seen it works. Um, we need the constructivistic nature of self-perception and its dependence on priors in order to incorporate these social realities, these cultural achievements into your self-model. <coughs> and then we see the emergence of immaterial realities from social interaction. using the social realities as perceptual priors for the construction of our self-model. So far, so good. The conclusion would be a naturalistic account of the spiritual dimension seems possible. It could help, if it were possible, to settle epistemic disputes that are long-lasting on the status of consciousness, of mental causation, and the mind-body problem. This is what philosophers are mainly interested in. But it could also lay out the foundations for a, a secular ethics, and it will have to do so. And I will give you a few arguments and then stop. Um, because this naturalistic view has severe consequences, because we have to realize that we are alone, and alone responsible for our planet. There is nothing that we can call for, and it will not answer. Because if the spiritual dimension is an emergent property of us, no way to look somewhere else. We will also have to realize that we have to act without being able to appreciate the full consequences of our acts. That's a direct consequence of the complexity of our systems that we have built. It's highly nonlinear. We cannot predict its evolution. If we do something, maybe we can predict the next two or three steps, but surely not the long-term trajectory. Still, we are obliged to interfere and act because we cannot just do nothing. And this implies that we have to support uncertainty. And this is so difficult. And this is one of the reasons why in the moment where the world seems so uncertain, we see all those totalitarian movements, which is very bad. Um, and we also realize that we have to establish a secular ethics. We have to derive the rules according to which we want to behave, because they will not be given to us by something outside. So some of the required virtues, I guess it's self-evident that humbleness is something that we really need to, um, to adopt. We need to admit our ignorance. We know so little. Um, we must mistrust unproven beliefs, because if there is no evidence, why should we believe something? So we, for that reason, we must mistrust those pretending that they know. And we have to develop confidence in self-organization, because we have no other rescue. We have to have confidence in the processes that self-organize, because this has brought us forth, this has stabilized our world until now, and we will have to continue to rely on this rather than on hierarchical dirigistic systems. And one, from this notion, one can derive a lot of ethical uh, um, prescriptions. One is, for example, do not lie, because if the nodes of a self-organizing system convey false information, they will collapse. It doesn't work. And then the other stuff is trivial. We have to be em empathic and tolerant. Let me finish with um, making a, another comment on the consequences of constructivistic perception on tolerance. You saw that we take as truth what we perceive. 
And even if we know otherwise, what we perceive, we take as primary truth. Now, priors do, of course, differ as a function of cultural embedding. That's trivial. Which means that people from different cultures will perceive the same process, especially cult um, social processes, um, in a different way. And knowing that priors determine what we perceive, we have to grant everybody the existence of multiple truths. This is the type of tolerance that we always postulate. Let the other one see the world as he or she likes. But we need to constrain this sort of tolerance because we need to insist on reciprocity of tolerance. If uh, we grant somebody else that he or she has a different view of the world, that's fine. But then we also have to insist that they grant us the same. And as soon as this reciprocity rule is violated, sanctions are required. So boundless tolerance wouldn't probably work well. With this, um, I would like to close. And thank you so much for your attention. It's late today, and, and particularly for the generous hospitality. I have never experienced such a thing before. Thank you.